economists to measure the economic impacts of the arts by looking at the impact on artists' incomes, on the numbers of hours that they work, on the viability of arts organizations, and the economic viability of the neighborhoods that they're in. But there are also what we call the intrinsic values of the arts. So really, arts' only function isn't to you know, generate income for other people or whatever. It's really to deliver these things that no other area of the economy can, like beauty and delight and political critique. And that is just as important as the economic impacts, because this is really the true role of arts and culture. When I was growing up in Boyle Heights, community didn't mean a lot. You know, there weren't a lot of places to really go entertain yourself. Even the movie theaters were, had all shut down. In the news, it was always about the drive-by, the gang, the drug bust. And I remember always feeling like people would look down on this neighborhood and, you know, they'd call us the ghetto. Even though there were a lot of beautiful things that maybe people who are not Latino would not appreciate or think consider culture. There was always mariachi music. There was street art everywhere. There was a muralist movement. Unfortunately, at night, things would just shut down in the neighborhood. And so I remember going to Universal City Walk or the Santa Monica Promenade because there was hardly a nightlife here in Boyle Heights. And I thought, but what's so tragic is that I go spend my money at these neon cities that are basically manufactured, they're not real communities. And I spend all my money there and, and this community gets none of my money. I left to go get educated. I lived in New York City and San Diego and San Francisco. I traveled a lot and I had success writing Real Women Have Curves, which was based on my experience working in a sewing factory. So I had like 20 productions of the play. And when I came back to Boyle Heights, community meant something else. Well, you know, when you come to this country and you're undocumented like I was, and you're, you don't feel Mexican, you don't feel American, you don't feel like you belong anywhere. For me, Boyle Heights uh, was the one place where I belonged. So community represented a sense of identity. And I said, God, I would love to have my own theater so that I could tell the stories that aren't being told and present plays to celebrate this neighborhood. And I wanted everyone to know about this community everything that you don't hear on the 5 o'clock news. Ma, what are you doing? I basically had no business plan, you know, very instinctual, very improvised. And luckily, because our community was like, okay, it's a theater, fine. You know, it's a room with chairs and a stage. Okay, it's a theater. So in that sense, there was a willingness for people to imagine. Can I just suggest? It was very easy to get actors and actresses and get people excited because a lot of Latino actresses are so talented but don't get the opportunities because very few people write for Latino actors. So there was a whole pool of, of talented people that wanted to participate and join in. The idea that I had wasn't just my individual idea, but it was an idea whose time had come as far as a renaissance. There's this buzzword in the arts community called creative placemaking. And I think the thinking goes that if you have a creative place, other creative places tend to grow up around it. Boyle Heights used to be a very Jewish neighborhood. My grandparents, great aunt and great uncle, spent some time here, a couple of them buried here. Uh, but I grew up on the west side. I mean, my experience of Boyle Heights was like to uh, drive here for a taco every couple of years and feel really brave. And then, you know, like 15, 20 years ago, Father Greg Boyle started Homeboy Industries and what had been a fairly gang-riddled neighborhood became less of one. And so when I came home from a job I'd been doing with the NEA in Washington, the gold line had opened while I was away, and, and I'm a transit geek, so I got off the train here at Mariachi Plaza. You know, white guy from the west side, they could have, you know, pulled up the drawbridge. Um, and instead, this guy, Paco, pours me a cup of coffee. And man, I was done for. I started this lending library, Libros Mibros, in English and Spanish. Would have been the easiest thing in the world from day one to just give away books. But I wanted to make the statement that books are worth something. 
So we evolved this system where for five bucks, you get borrowing privileges here all year. You can check out a book for three weeks, uh, you can certainly renew it all you want, and you get a free book to keep, winding up at home, not only where they can read it, but siblings, parents, grandparents. Libros, from very early on, has become a kind of crossroads. We see a lot of people here passing books back and forth between total strangers. When I see multiple generations of the same family come in, curled up around uh, two copies of a book, one in English and one in Spanish, um, it just makes my day. Our lending library is on Mariachi Plaza. Some people think that they're here just playing for fun or playing to entertain each other, but that is not the case. Uh, we certainly love it when they strike up a tune, but they're hustling to feed their families. Yo llegué a esta comunidad hace 30 años y ya estaban los mariachis aquí. Y tenemos mariachis para cualquier ocasión. Tenemos mariachis para bodas, para aniversarios, obviamente para funerales. En la organización de Omula, en los principios, Tuvimos más de 200 agremiados. El trabajo de un mariachi, pues no nada más es ganar el dinero y todo bien. El trabajo de un mariachi es ir a alegrar un evento, es celebrar. Por eso te están contratando, festejar cualquier evento. Ese es el trabajo de un mariachi. Having Mariachi Plaza just across the street from where I have my bar, Eastside Love, is incredibly important to me because when I got married back in 1993, found a couple of different mariachis, made a deal, and rocked my wedding. Growing up in the 80s in Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles, it was predominantly Mexican, Mexican-American community, and it still is. When I started my bar, I didn't want to do a bar that was just for Mexicans. And I didn't want to do a bar that was just for Americans. I really wanted to do a bar that was for Mexican Americans. The businesses that exist here, the ones that thrive and the ones that continue to stay in business are the ones that are filling the needs of Mexican Americans. You sit down, you have a beer, you'll start to notice some details like our chandeliers to represent a low rider steering wheel, plastic over our furniture. It might take people back to what their grandmother did. You can order a michelada that has a saladito in it. Something that if you grew up in East Los Angeles, immediately you're gonna get. But not every night is the same here at East I Love. I mean, we put on a lot of different nights that involve art and culture. And we produce nights uh, where we get mariachis and you can sign up and sing with mariachis called mariachi What does the first singer of the night get? Yeah. 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 Kiss me. One of my favorite nights that we put on here is Morrissey Oki, where the customer could sing uh, karaoke to the Smiths or Morrissey. So I don't really know why it is that a lot of Mexican Americans are drawn to this British singer, Morrissey, but it's there. And we get to experience it here once a month. So there's even one guy that shows up who translates all of the Morrissey songs that he sings into Spanish. Pero, llame, llame. Pero, llame. And he does them beautifully, and while he's doing them, you really feel like you're looking at Mexican Morrissey. In running my bar, I really consider it like being a curator, and I really feel like every single dollar is equal to an applause. Almost like an affirmation of like, keep on doing it, we want to support you, we want to patronize your place, we believe in what you're doing. Spaces how we have now in Bull Heights around arts and culture really supports um, the local economy uh, by being a place that attracts people locally as well as you know from other neighborhoods, and then they go and support other businesses surrounding the arts and culture. Well, now we are known as a place where uh, world premieres of plays happen, where film festivals happen. I'd like to think that I was one of the few organizations that started the Spark. But there, I think there were a lot of other nonprofits and activists who said, wow, we got to do something for our community. And then eventually now we have a little bit of a flame that's creating more sparks and more artists are getting excited about our community. As Boyle Heights begins to get on the radar of people that have more financial means than the people in that community, appropriately there's a sense of trepidation. That's the G word. 
That's gentrification. Even the, even the plaza, even Mariachi Plaza, where we are, has developers circling around it. They're discovering us. And it's kind of odd because we go, wow, we've been here all along. You know, you're not Columbus discovering us. But if they come and acknowledge, like, what is already happening and say, well, how do I contribute? Rather than just saying, this is my flag, this is my neighborhood, I, I claim it. And they don't care about what's already going on. How does a neighborhood change and even potentially benefit from resources that it didn't have access to before and still retain its integrity and the very texture that longtime residents are responsible for creating? That's the big question of the day of how do we continue to have that thriving arts and culture while making sure that those artists that have been here that got us to this place can continue to be here. I think the Boyle Heights is very unique because of its rich history, but I think what is very universal is the fact that other people care and that we value community more than profit. What happens when you shift the paradigm from profit to community, then you get a community of people that you love being around them because you go, wow, that person's being courageous. That person is really taking on their dream and you're surrounded by dream makers. On opening night, we're usually sold out because everyone likes to come and celebrate and party with us. And it's wonderful when we present the play. All right, enjoy the show. Mama, what are you doing? In my own house that I gladly share with my family. <laughs> I swore over my stack of Cosmo Latina <laughs> that if I look in that mirror and find even a single wrinkle on my face, I'm going to kill you. To me, when you place value on community, and you see the value in other people, your life becomes valuable. Because on your deathbed, you're not gonna be saying, oh, I should've had a bigger house, I should've had a bigger car. I should've... It's gonna be, wow, I should've loved more. I should've been connected to people. I should've expressed my love. And so to me, when people shift from profit to community and connection, that's when you have an artistic renaissance because the renaissance is happening in your soul, in your heart and then it, it extends wide.